Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. I've got a great episode today. I'm speaking with Dr. Megan Reese. She's the CEO and founder of Solid Intel. It's a company that's focused on de-risking supply chains, especially given how fractious the geopolitics of the world looks right now. That's an incredibly important task. This is all accomplished through AI. So during this episode, we're going to get into so many different things from the supply chain conversation to the promise and perils of building a company in the AI space. And of course, we're going to speak about Megan's career working in the company building space, but also coming from academia and Capitol Hill. So, so many great things here. Hope you all enjoy this conversation and definitely let me know what you think in the comments below. Megan Reese, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you too. I've known you for a couple of years, and this is going to be a fun episode because it's a combination of my like national security and geopolitics, domestic resiliency interest with the fact that you're also the founder of a company in the technology space. So we can combine all my different podcasting interests into one so folks have heard a little bit about your background in the introduction that I read before we started this conversation. So let's just set the table, go really easy that way. Your main focus back when you are in DC and the experience you're bringing to the technology sector is your knowledge of geopolitics and risk. Can you just give us the like status quo understanding of how we should understand like the geopolitics and risk topic in the space we're describing today? I, I think that the the very first thing that people who are thinking about this topic need to think about is that the world is fundamentally shifting. Um, we've been in kind of the stasis position of the U.S. as the global superpower since the end of the Cold War, and it was generally uncontested. And there's been a movement over the last decade or so, um, although the Chinese would actually uh, argue that it started uh, quite a bit sooner than that, the, the mid 2000s, that China is becoming a global power, that that means that there are going to be a lot of competitive efforts from the Chinese to compete with the Western uh, world order. And so all of those efforts are going to lead to contentious results. So does this mean that we're going to have a country that's trying to compete to overtake the dollar as the world currency? Are we going to have a country that's going to compete with the known boundaries of how we do, for instance, shipping lanes or expectations of how far out sea lanes go? Um, are we going to have competitions over known boundaries that, for instance, China is going through every single archive in their country to try to make claims that certain boundaries are actually in their favor historically and that all of the lines that are drawn now are wrong. And then another thing that I just care about deeply, are human rights going to be contested in every single sphere because the view of human rights is fundamentally different in China than it is in Western liberal democracies. And when it comes down to it, we have to do, or we have to be willing to compete in each of these spheres because at least in my view, fundamentally humans are better off with the framing the Western liberal order that we have now. And if we allow a contentious alternative superpower to come in and rewrite the world order, rewrite all of these rules, um, it's actually going to be worse for people writ large. Yeah, so, no, that's a great yeah. summary of kind of the state of play right now. My real question for you then, given the fact that you're now working with businesses in the technology sector, when you're describing everything you just said, where does business stop and mm -hmm. politics begin? Because across those different topics, like so, for example, the human rights question is obviously going to relate to like the Uyghur, you know, forced mm -hmm. labor prevention act. So, if you're a Western corporation that uses goods that could be sourced via Uyghur slave labor, that is obviously like a business perfect intersection with political dynamics. It's a little more straightforward and harder just to like debate over, quote unquote, where I think, see this is a little more complicated are things like, okay, competition. Is is competition a potentially um, treacherous thing to do? Is that something that puts you on the road to conflict? And obviously the business community doesn't want conflict. How do you understand like the business slash politics separation? 
Yeah, there are large differences depending on the sector that businesses are operating in. But I think there's overall a growing understanding that this all of this stuff actually matters. And it doesn't come from the competition per se, it comes from COVID. But if you look at, say, the defense sector, there's there's obviously clear understanding that if you have problematic technological components in your widget, that that could lead to a risk factor um, if it's coming from China or Russia or someplace problematic, that there could be you know, bad code, there could be um, viruses, all of that stuff. But if you're looking at something like agriculture, then maybe you don't have any concerns other than some of these forced labor issues. Um, if you're looking at solar panels, you've, you you know, just need to get your stuff to market, but also you've dealt with you know, IP theft. So depending on the sector, there's different recognition of the problems. Um, but when it comes down to it, there there is going to be, in, in my view, a growing and growing understanding of the overall risk if you see some of these shifts happening um, or if you see some sort of flashpoint where, there, where there's some economic separation. So what I think is happening, especially in Europe, um, the US is actually a little ahead of the curve compared to um, say Germany. You're, you're going to start seeing some hedging, you're gonna see some, uh, you know, creating copy of supply chains in less risky countries, just in case stuff happens. But for especially smaller companies that don't really have these like massive groups to, to kind of seek out alternatives, they're mostly hoping for the best um, while recognizing there are problems. So what, you know, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how to make sure that people understand risk in these areas and then also move on it when it becomes necessary to do so. And ideally even ahead of time, which is something the business community does not love doing. Something I'd love to understand because it kind of illustrates the risk dynamic helpfully is what do you see if you're speaking with a business you're working with as the opportunity when it comes to foreign markets, especially those in Asia broadly, because it's kind of funny, we've spent so much time talking about the very obvious risks, and that's everything from COVID to trade wars during the 2010s with mm -hmm. the Trump administration, many policies of which were carried over by the Biden administration. But if we were to go back to, you know, like when you and I were like in high school, so much yeah. of the conversation around Asia was just purely opportunity based, like mm -hmm. the cliches, the world is flat, globalization is happening, there's always opportunity there. Now that we focus so much on the risk side of things. What do you see as the opportunity yeah. um, circa 2023? I, so so I, I should clarify, most businesses still see the Chinese market as like the, the best possible thing because there are so many people. But as as businesses are becoming a little more cognizant of risk issues, they're, they're really trying to think about alternative markets um, for supply chains, for instance. And because the Chinese market is getting more expensive for production, looking in Southeast Asia, for instance, you can actually find sometimes cheaper alternatives. Going to Mexico, Mexico is, you know, sometimes hard to find uh, like the right supplier. They're sometimes behind the ball on, you know, making sure that you, you know where to look, but they may end up being cheaper than China is at the moment as China is going up um, in, in what they're paying employees, for instance. And so the cost actually may be flat. It may be in some places lower. It may be higher, let's be honest. Um, so it's just balancing all of these things. And I think that companies are trying to figure out how, how much time can we get in the Chinese market for supply chains before we have to shift, but also recognizing there's a lot of movement towards shifting regardless of risk or just other factors coming into play. The way you set that up also leads to a useful follow-up question. What is the difference when it comes to the opportunity of serving the Chinese market? So like mm -hmm. selling your goods in the Chinese market mm -hmm. versus relying on the Chinese market for production of goods that will go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. How would you differentiate those two opportunities? 
I mean, the, this is this is the big Trump tariff war, right? Like, can can we sell into the Chinese market at the the right um, amount and make sure that the Chinese don't have so many restrictions that they keep our goods from coming in? And everything that I'm seeing is saying that she is actually going to go like more um, opposing importation of goods. So there's um, Matt Pottinger, the former uh, deputy national security advisor under Trump, he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs not too long ago that kind of highlights the food issue, for instance. So China has, um, you know, tons of people, they are not that great at producing agricultural goods compared to other parts of the world. They're just not, they, they don't have the Ukraine bread basket, I'll say that. And she is moving people towards um, needing self-sufficiency in agriculture. So that's one of the goals of the CCP at the moment is how do we get to a point of self-sufficiency, not just there, but in all of these other sectors. And in my view, you only have these aspirations of self-sufficiency if you're planning on either doing something that causes the reduced importation of goods from the outside um, or kind of assuming there will be a lot of the goods will be sanctioned. So at the moment, the key thing is know, just to understand yeah. this. Yes. The self-sufficiency is not economically ideal or efficient, mm-hmm. correct? Oh, of course not. Yeah. It, you know, that's never. Because be I'm just saying goal. this because like, you know, <laughs> the, with when you're dealing with like mixed audiences of people. Yeah. Sometimes with these trade centric conversations, specific phrasings just sound ideal. So like, why would we not be self-sufficient? with food. Um, So the point is that like there's a, it's a balancing act and what you're arguing and what Pottinger is arguing is they've crossed over between the balancing act of sufficiency relative to the outsiderism towards this is very economically inefficient and you'd be just doing this as a hedging risk thing. As a hedging risk. Yes. So, so while they're not there on all of these different um, sectors of the economy, as far as import like banning imports or anything that the hedging on this stuff is very, very interesting. And I think they're, they're huge indicators of where the Chinese market is going. So it doesn't mean move away from it now. um, But it means spend a lot of time thinking about what this looks like if this is not an open market going forward. And so I, I think pretty much every company that relies on this market needs to be thinking about that really seriously. Yeah, I think this is a good pivot to what you are actually doing with uh, your company, Solid Intel. Yeah, just please introduce it, take it yeah. wherever uh, direction you want to go, and then we'll of course get into the you know academia to the hill to the mm-hmm. uh, CEO company founding uh, discussion. But yeah, just start with the company. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so I left the hill not too long ago and founded an AI company um, that we are actually helping. SMEs in particular understand and de- what's an SME? Supply to, uh, small and mid-sized enterprises, smaller and mid-sized businesses. You know, heavy focus on the mid-sized. Let's be honest, and helping them understand the risk in their supply chains and then de-risk. So AI has been enormously helpful in helping disaggregate the components of the supply chain and then really understand where risk lies in each different uh, node of the supply chain. So the the precursor for this is I spent, you know, a lot of time on the Hill thinking about things like the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act and getting an influx of companies telling us that we don't know our supply chains well enough to comply with the provisions of the law. This law is actually very, very strict and says that if you have any components in your supply chain that are made in this specific geographic region in China, the presumption is they're made with forced labor and those goods can be seized as they're coming through our our ports. And the administration is actually really starting to ramp up enforcement of this law. And so I started thinking, you know, that there's actually a real opportunity here. There, There are some, great companies that exist right now that are really helping Fortune 100s, Fortune 500s comply with these things, under, using, also using AI, some of them, uh, to understand supply chains. But there's this entire sector of the economy that is 
very, very important to the long-term economic health of the U.S. Like we can't let this entire sector of the economy stay exposed to potentially having their goods seized or that they haven't, for instance, de-risked from the Chinese market um, in the way that the larger corporations have. So if you ever do have, say, a flashpoint over Taiwan and there's an economic um, shift that results from that, we want to make sure this entire sector of the economy is healthy. And so that's the precursor for me wanting to start this company. And, you know, it goes well beyond the Chinese market. Um, I'm already thinking heavily about, you know, all of these other countries that rely on SMEs or have them as the majority of their economies, like Japan, for instance. Um, and then thinking about alternative places that this works. I care deeply about Ukraine, for instance, um, and geographic exclusions of any U.S. dollars that end up going to Ukraine are very, very important. We don't want our money's our money to be funneled to the you know Chinese supply chains, for instance. Yeah, no, and uh, the reason why I'm glad I asked for the definition of SME <laughs> is we all have specific very specific understandings of what like a fortune 100 is or a yes. fortune 500 but and i saw this crazy statistic like there are hundreds and, and it's it's obvious when you say it out loud but there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of american companies that do some form of business investment mm -hmm. production selling in china that and because it's Fortune 100 and it's Fortune 500, um, that's barely a little dint of it. So, give us a picture of what you're. If you're, if you're, you know, if I was speaking to your founder size, you're getting your pitch deck together. What is just sort of like the perfect way to understand like what one of these medium sized enterprises look like? Like, where is it based in the country? Yeah. Like, what does it do? Um, and how prepared is it? due to its lack of scale for some sort of geopolitical event happening like a Taiwan crisis, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, to be honest, they, they cross all the sectors. So some of them that we're, we're thinking about as early customers are in the, the sectors that are particularly being um, the focus of U S regulate, like the U S regulatory environment. So in Xinjiang, that's, that's textiles, that's electronics, tomatoes is one of them, uh, solar panels is big. And then we have, you know, risky SOEs that do a lot of the protect, uh, production. So anything that goes through touches of a military SOE, for instance, is at risk. Um, and so these are these are some of the basic clients that we're, we're thinking through right now. Um, you know, there are these things called roll-ups. There are uh, private equity firms that actually uh, have stakes in a lot of mid-sized businesses and small businesses in particular. And so there, there are ways to get to these clients. But if you go to an individual mom and pop, um, you know, manufacturing, they often will think that they are not at risk. And then the bigger, the bigger the client, the more they're recognizing the risk. Um, and then the more likely they are to touch on these very high risk sectors, the more they recognize that they need to start changing what they're doing, because the customers that they're selling to, say, a defense prime, is starting to tell them, you know, the government is on our back. We know that our supply chains are already hard to deal with. We can't just give you products for you to deal with this on your own, but maybe we can help you figure out um, how, how to de-risk and make sure that we are not interrupted in fulfilling our contracts. So there's, there's this ecosystem where it's becoming more and more known. COVID honestly helped what I'm trying to do a lot because even the mom and pop stores now understand that if something gets messed up overseas, it's going to impact their bottom line. Um, but it's just making sure that, you know, they move forward and in, in um, de-risking themselves. And I want to understand exactly in this SME category, what is the risk, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's not, especially in the category that you're describing here that, you know, Disney builds 
um, Shanghai Disneyland and there's a Taiwan yeah. crisis and the investment goes to zero, or yeah. it's you're a VC firm. And this is obviously part of the broader issue that Sequoia is running into your VC firm and you're investing in all these like Chinese companies. And like, once again, your investment goes to zero. If you're an SME, like what is the risk should something happen, whether it's like another supply chain yeah. crunch or a Taiwan crisis, like help me understand that. Yeah, there are a couple different things that could happen. There's there's the simple stuff, the slowdowns. Um, those risks are often not from regulatory burdens, but from other things going on the, in the world. And you know, if you're not running on this this huge surplus, then you're you need to get things to market as quickly as possible. And if you have a three week slowdown, it can massively disrupt um, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to sell in the market. If you have a six month slowdown, that can be a killer for a company. Um, actually, honestly, three weeks can be a killer for, for a company. And then you're having good seized imports. Um, if they're not in compliance with sanctions regulations or with um, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act regulations. So those goods can just never come back to you because the assumption is that they they were made with forced labor and they're not allowed in the market at all. Um, and then so those those are some of like the easier things to wrap your head around. Um, but you know, there's just there are a lot of different things that that touch on these categories. Um, we're we're less focused on the force majeure risks, the earthquakes, the mm. um, monsoons, different things like that that can impact that. But those those capabilities are are those identifications are also pretty easily um, incorporated into an AI product. So, when you talk about the AI side of thing to what you just said, because I kind of get why AI would be so important here. Obviously large data sets, these like are very like opaque. Mm -hmm. um, if you were looking, and obviously we're in the middle of like the AP, the AI hype period. If, if you were just sort of sitting in, let's say 2018, mm -hmm. um, and you, we were having this form of conversation, what would have been so difficult about yeah. addressing the vulnerability, the lack of transparency that AI has now made much more feasible from your perspective? Yeah, um, I probably won't get too into what we've been able to do with our product that we're really excited about, but on a really high level, um, there is, it depends on the market you're in, of course, but China, you, you, you guys have read the stories. Your listeners have left, read the stories. They're kicking out auditors. They're passing all of these laws about espionage and all of these different things that they're. I actually people didn't. Are, I'm actually not. I'm, you, oh, you caught me. I'm not, oh, I'm not reading I? these stories. So yeah, oh, please yeah. Uh, tell me. Tell me more. Yes. Yeah. So um, basically, some of the top auditing firms are are you know being told. Uh, so SOEs are being told that if you share information with the top auditors, and those are the state owned, the Chinese like state owned enterprises. State owned enterprises. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Tell me if I use an acronym that uh, <laughs> you've been, you've been pretty standard. good. We, we've we've got okay. the two. <laughs> Great. Um, so SOEs sharing information with auditors can be considered now sharing state secrets. So that you know that's a jail term. I worked on the Hill. I I we we had cases of business people in in jail in China. That's not something you want to deal with. Um, and so are these you're, American you're business having... people or are these Chinese business yes. people? Yes, Americans. And so you um, but but this case is, you know, the Chinese are at risk themselves of um, sharing state secrets. It's unclear what counts as a state secret. And so auditors are, you know, not able to do the job they were doing before. And so you're starting to see like, how are you going to be able to comply with US laws um, and regulations on these things? Honestly, you're going to have to use tech tools to do it. Um, other things that AI is actually great at that wasn't really feasible Wait, quick before. Pause. What, what, oh. Just to just to understand this, right? Like, yeah. why is it a given that you have to use tech? So like, let me think about it this way, right? Mm -hmm. This is me speaking as a podcaster slash yeah. like think tanky person. I imagine that if I'm building a widget, there's just like mm -hmm. an Excel spreadsheet that lists all the components of the widget. Yeah. And therefore, yes. like, what tech do you need beyond like the ability to read Microsoft Excel? I know it's obviously not that yeah. simple. You wouldn't have an opportunity if it was, but like explain yeah. like the that 
uninformed uh, understanding I have and the actual yeah. problem. First of all, you don't always know all of the components in your widget, but ideally, you know all the components in your widget, but you have to know where all the, the things come from. And upstream supply chains, usually companies, especially in the SME category, know their first supplier. They sometimes know their secondary supplier. They almost never know their tertiary supplier. And so all the all the entire upstream beyond usually the primary is pretty opaque to them. They never really tried to know what that is. And now our laws and regulations, they all we always had forced labor laws. We always had some of these prohibitions, but we didn't really enforce them and we didn't create these like massive regulatory um, compliance uh, structures that you know, the Forced Labor Prevention Act has in place now. And so you're telling people to know your entire upstream and yet they don't know it. So you have to either figure out, you know, do we send an auditor to each of these places to ensure compliance, the entire upstream line? Or is there a way that we can identify the risk, at least at the level the U.S. government can do so? Um, through tech. And honestly, that is significantly, it's significantly cheaper and less burdensome on the company. But it's happening at the same time that China is making it a lot more difficult for the on the ground people to do that upstream compliance um, and tracing. So this, this is the right time for this. Um, there's, there's some other stuff, though, that AI makes a lot easier. So I come from the national security world. Um, and China is one of those countries we have SOE, state-owned enterprises, acronyms, um, and they, you know, a lot of them are places that we don't want U.S. investment in, into these companies, and that's, that's actually a big movement on the Hill is identifying kind of the risky SOE sectors, um, and like, like, Anywhere else, you're going to see subsidiaries and you're going to see companies that have, you know, the same name or a slightly differentiated name, um, keeping they're going to be associated with a sanctioned person that may go by multiple different names or it doesn't translate easily into the English language, you know, first and last name sh switching or like different versions of first and last name. And so AI is actually much better at identifying these subsidiaries. They're much better at identifying, you know, um, different versions of the same name, different versions of the same people. And so we're, we're able to see a lot more into this than we would have been able to like pre chat GBT. And just zooming out, and just asking, you know, the AI space is obviously the hot space right now. And once again, we're still in a bit of a tech downturn. So the term like hot space means not quite yeah. the same thing it meant when it's mid 2021, you're a crypto founder, but can you just talk about like the AI space in general, like not in terms of like, yeah. is it good? Is it bad? More just like, what's it like to be in the middle of that at this moment? I, so I, I understand why people are freaked out. I do get it, but working in this and working with, you know, my technical co-founders and other engineers, I'm just spending a lot of time being really excited about what is feasible now that would have been much more difficult a couple of years ago. And, you know, spending a lot of time exploring what, what can we build? What can we build quickly? How do we get things to market? in a way that would have taken much, much longer, would have been honestly less interesting um, mm -hmm. than it was before. And I think that, you know, as all of these conversations about AI risk and, you know, all of the bad things happen, my fear is that those become the focus of the conversations. And of course it has to be part of it, but, we have to also seriously think about what the benefits are and make sure that we don't regulate ourselves out of receiving those benefits. So I spend a lot of time thinking and talking to other founders about that. And, you know, we're still in, we're, we're pre go to market. So we're still in this exploring building um, and being very excited stage of our company and AI is the reason it's possible. So we are going to take a bit of a narrative pivot. Realignment listeners know that typically these episodes are very much like guest, tell me your policy expertise. I'm not really interested in the biographical thing, but 
that said, especially because I've, I've known you since like 2016, yeah. um, you at a career level, like, you know, Stanford, you go to get your PhD at, you know, University of Texas, you go work on the Halo on your phone, uh, a, a technology company. You're like the beau ideal of a realignment listener. I, I, I'm preparing <laughs> my grant, uh, grant um, proposals. And the question they always ask is like, what's your listener? And like, you, you actually are, if, if, if I'm thinking of what I want, like a 21, 22, 23 year old staff yeah. assistant on the Hill to be like thinking they could do with their career, like it's actually you. Um, so now that I gave that compliment, like I want to talk about like that <laughs> background and how this all kind of came together. I'm going to jump around a bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. Um, so forgive me if it's not perfectly narratively tight. So number one, you said something uh, a minute ago where you referenced that you are not a you are not the technical co-founder. Um, and anyone who is jumping from DC world and then is entering into technology world, like Silicon Valley, venture capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will be introduced to this idea of like the technical co-founder, someone yeah. who could code, someone who could like build something. Um, and oftentimes, if you are a non-technical co-founder, you're going to want to find a technical co-founder, not just to yeah. build the product, but even raise the money. Um, do you regret at all, especially because you were at Stanford in the 2000s, not learning to code and oh. becoming technical relative to the time you spent getting a PhD and working in a social science category? Not even a little bit. I So the only reason my company exists is because this background, you know, getting a PhD, being in this policy world, the only reason this company exists in any real way is because I spent so many years, so many years developing expertise to be able to understand the geopolitical environment and see where opportunity exists. And Stanford's really unique in that, you know, I, I did I did grow up in this world. I grew up in the world of brilliant people using technical skills to try to change the world. And so I, I knew that was always feasible and I didn't have to be the person coding to be able to use that as part of my like career trajectory. And so this, this is just a thing that I, I actually think that more non-technical people need to think seriously about is where can our skill set be used? Because we do have a skill set. We uh, like, there's, there's no way I spent that much time in DC without developing at least a little bit of knowledge about how the geopolitical winds were shifting um, and, and using it to team up with the technical expertise is kind of the sweet spot. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because if, as I'm, we're in the middle of this uh, narrative reset around the skills and the backgrounds of what a <laughs> successful founder looks like because now we're discovering that a, like as the type of problems you're attempting to solve using technology, the internet, et cetera, yeah. are changing. That and the funding environment is so like the zero interest yeah. rate phenomenon, ZERP. Um, the trend, that's going to change it. But I think yeah. of the line you would think of during the two, 2010s of like, well, guess what? Like Travis Kalanick didn't know how the taxi industry did, worked. Um, yeah. like, mo like a lot, a lot of these founders and these these people who built big companies and what separate one what the companies ever became profitable, but but a, but a baseline level they were not the 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 advantage of being able to be of being technical yeah. and of of being able to like iterate quickly um obviated like deep experience in a category yeah. um so i guess my question to you is to what degree do you think there could be a technical founder in your category who could do what you're doing without the yeah. policy history etc expertise yeah um it, listen, I feel pretty confident that you could build something, um, but there has to be some knowledge base on what what is coming down the line that a pure technical capability can't get at. And what we hope to be delivering to our clients is not just the risk where it lies now, but the risk that we see to coming down the pipeline. And unless you can figure out how to do that and as, as great as, you know, a chat GPT is, it's not going to be able to do that particularly successfully. Um, so unless you have that knowledge base, I don't, I, I just don't think you can deliver as great of a product, but, you know, big fan of people going out, shooting their shot and seeing if they can make something work. Um, you know, 
the the most successful companies we we look at the unicorns and mm-hmm. a lot of them have these you know fresh out of school folks but a lot of them don't a lot of them come from like deep expertise in an industry and use that to build something big and magical. And so while the narrative is great that a Mark Zuckerberg is coming down the line, most people are not Mark Zuckerberg, but can still build something big and meaty and expensive and difficult and really wonderful. So if any of the listeners are considering this themselves, just because you didn't do it at 22 or 23, you still have time. Yeah. And the other place to jump then is you went to get a PhD after your time at Stanford. You're obviously in academia. There's a lot of kind of, uh, let's say, pessimism um, around like academia and the PhD construct. I'm like happy that my podcasting has just helped me kind of like hack around that system. Um, So I'm able to work work in think tank world. But it's because I very specifically developed a skill set. It wasn't like, hey, Hudson Institute, hey, UT, you know. I'm a policy yeah. expert and they're like, where's your PhD? It's like, hey, like I'm good at interviewing and talking to people. <laughs> that's a skill set you need. So that's my own personal piece yeah. of advice for folks. Like if you want to work in these systems, be sure to develop like a critical skill set dip- differentiated from just pure book learning. But talk about yeah. PhDs right now because I just see a lot of pessimism because a lot of listeners are, once again, in this category, even people who are on the Hill, like what, what are your thoughts on PhDs today? It's, it's really interesting. Um, I will discourage most people from getting a PhD. And then every once in a while, I see someone and I'm like, you are the right person for this. And so, key thing, when you mean discourage yes. most people, you mean even within the category of interest, like national yes. security, like even, even it's so like, obviously, like if you're just a normal person, don't do it. But you're yes. like, even in the typical 20, yes. 30 years ago, you would have done it space, you'd recommend against it. Yes. So I think the majority of people who are coming up through the policy world and are thinking about doing a PhD, my, the way they presented it to me, almost, and like almost every person who's talked to me about it are wanting to do it for, oh, this is going to sound cynical, slightly prestige reasons. Mm -hmm. They want to be called doctor. Um, there's some, you know, I'm mid career, maybe if I get a PhD, then I'll be able to get that next boost in my career. Um, different, different things like that. And then you'll see the person who just has this innate desire to learn to spend just a copious amount of time reading books, writing, developing knowledge, um, getting at these like smaller things that they think can then translate into the policy world in a much bigger way that they wouldn't be able to do through a hill job or through an agency job. Those are the people that I I suggest moving in that direction, even if they don't want to become professors. That's that's where I was. I I just loved, loved, loved developing ex, like very, very strong expertise in something. And I thought that's also a way I'd be able to differentiate myself in my career. And but I did it at a a pretty young age. I didn't do it going back into academia in say my 30s or 40s. Um, there is a huge opportunity cost to getting a PhD. You're you're losing out. Like, first of all, real quick to listeners, if you are considering paying for your PhD for the love of everything, you're going to the wrong program, you should be getting paid for your PhD. But you're getting paid at a very, very, very low number, a barely above like poverty wages number. Um, and so there's huge opportunity costs because it's it's years of your life. And so you're going to be making sacrifices during some of these very pivotal earning years. So it, it sure as heck be, better be worth it to you to do it. And I'd recommend doing it at a younger age than later, even though I think, um, you know, people more my age would probably get a tiny bit more out of it, but the opportunity cost in your life is so high that it's probably not worth it. So now you can talk about working on the Hill, right? So you get your yeah. PhD and then you like, you, you come to the Hill like a little after, which is once again, this is not quite done. You, you've done these things like in a very interesting kind of like order and everything. <laughs> so yeah, talk about, you know, so you're with Senator Sass, you're with Senator Ronnie, just talk about the working on the Hill. Yeah. Um, I, 
I had the opportunity to work on the Hill coming straight out of my PhD, which was, I, I had a, a mentor um, in my office with Senator Sass name, Klon Kitchen, who was over at the, at AEI until recently, he may still be there as a visiting fellow. Um, and he just told me, spend your entire first year treating this like you're getting a master's degree in Hill studies because you will have no idea what's going on for the entire first year you're there. It's a an institution of archaic rules. You never know what's happening. You have you come with a plethora of like really interesting, fun ideas that should turn into policy and would make the world better, but you have no idea how to translate it in your first year there. Um, by the time I got hired as Senator Mitt Romney's national security um, advisor, I. I knew enough about what I was doing. I was there for almost four and a half years. And I'd say there was not a single week that went by that I did not end up asking, what does this mean in terms of Senate rules and standards and different things like that? Um, and I, I got hired, though, by Senator Romney to be a I'd say a different type of Hill staffer than is the norm. Um, I came in with a PhD. I came in with, you know, this think tank and academia experience. And one of the things my old chief of staff, chief of staff and I talked about as I was getting hired was having the expectation that I am still reading roughly a book a week just to, to continue increasing my knowledge level, that I continue to engage with Hill and academia to make sure that we were at the forefront of new academic information coming down the line. And that is just a completely atypical experience for a Hill staffer, but they wanted someone who came in with this great, like, great politics background, um, who knew all of these different worlds and was able to draw from these networks in a way that I wouldn't say the typical Hill staffer knows how to do. So to really sum everything up, like what would you say, because we're in the career section of this episode and the future <laughs> for me, what would you say the opportunity is for your prime 20 something realignment listener who probably works in DC or has worked in tech and kind of wants to like switch over and do something different. You can come from both angles. Like what would you kind of say is the opportunity um, right now, if you're interested in the type of stuff that like we're discussing here? Well, I'd say that there's actually, this is a very unique time. If you are interested in this tech and policy world, this is the point where all of the members are starting to realize, hey, this is very important. Maybe we should, maybe we should draw in people who know what they're talking about. And the thing is, you know, when you're 25, 26, keep a little bit of humil humility. You have so much you still need to learn, but you you do have value add to this world. And so just jump, jump in. Um, like be willing to take a slightly lower paying job, um, ideally at a higher level. So I know that's a weird thing, but maybe start at a slightly higher level on the House side and jump over to the Senate or um, start on the Senate side, but with a very clear trajectory up so that you can get into this like meaty, difficult, interesting policy stuff as soon as possible. Um, don't delay it, you know, get your master's degree. Often a lot of offices won't hire people without master's degrees, which is dumb. I don't, I don't actually think they, they fundamentally change the work product of people that I'm seeing with them or without them, but it, it's often kind of a barrier to entry. So have something like that, but just jump in and, and start, start doing you, like all of your listeners are going to be smart, interesting people, and they're fully capable of doing all these different things. Also, be willing to take unexpected um, career trajectories. Don't, don't set out your goal at 22 and say it has to look like this at every step. If I had done that, I would be a pediatric surgeon in Omaha right now. Um, well, because your your major is biochem, right? Undergrad, yeah, uh, human biology. Yeah, okay. I I was I was on the pre med track. I was up, like interviewing at med schools when I decided to shift, and being willing to shift when you're young is very. I mean, it it changed my life. 
it's so much better because of it. So be willing to shift if you find yourself being interested in something that's unexpected. It will create really interesting opportunities. That's awesome. So this is a great place to end the conversation. Uh, Megan, where should uh, folks go to learn more about your work? I know you're a fellow at the um, Atlantic Council. Um, you know, where should they go learn about that, learn about solid intel, all that great stuff? Well, we are still um, in the developer stage, so our website is maybe not at the part of the place that we want it to be when we have a full influx of people coming, but feel free to visit our solidintel.com webpage um, and then reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I'd be happy to chat. Great. Megan, thank you Excellent. for joining me on The Realignment. Excellent. Thank you, Marshall.